Come on, y'all ready? Hey, before we get started, can we welcome our Colleen Campus and all those that are joining us online? Let them know how much we love them. Man, we're so glad to be able to jump back in to this series. It's a super unique series, and I just heard actually this week from the Holy Spirit that we're going to continue it on all the way throughout the month of June. It's called The Immortals, and it's all about taking the men and women that God has used over time and taking their story out of the Word of God and seeing how it can apply to our lives here today. How can we pull from what they did and start where their platform, where their ceiling was, can become our platform. And we want to be able to step off of that and use that. But before we jump into it, I got something really cool I want to show you. We've been working and developing on how to make your learning experience better here at Reach Church because we all want to be lifelong learners. Because the moment you choose to stop learning is the moment you choose to start declining. Knowledge has so much power within it, and God wants us to have as much as we can. So we've been developing the notes section within our app. If you haven't downloaded the Reach Church app, make sure to do that as soon as possible, even today. And I'm going to show you how to get to the notes. We're going to make this better, keep developing it. But for right now, we're going to bring up on the screen here a little video right off of my phone. You just go right to the series. You click it. Then it brings you up to where you can plug in the orange blanks with whatever is up on the screen. Some of those will be orange and white here. And then down at the bottom when you're done, this is super cool, you can save it and you can either send it to your notes immediately to save within your iPhone or if you don't have an iPhone, you can text message it to yourself and copy and paste it. And here's the super cool thing. As you're really into what the preacher's saying, because he's bad to the bone, right? So as you're really into what he's saying, if you miss one of the fill in the blanks, no big deal. When you go ahead and transport that to notes or to text message, it automatically fills it in for you. Isn't that nice? So you guys could jump on there and start logging. We're going to keep developing that and try to make it its own section of the app where you could just keep an on-running log of all the notes of how God's speaking to you throughout each and every word that he brings forth. Okay? So y'all ready to rock and roll? Can we give Jesus one big one before we get started? It's just awesome. Jumping into part three of the immortals, and today we're going to be talking about Stephen. Stephen is mentioned very little, but he does a lot. And his story and his legacy carry on in the hearts and minds of everyone that's ever especially read just simply a chapter and a half of the book of Acts. We see his story develop in Acts chapter 6 and finish in Acts chapter 7, Stephen was an incredible man of God. He only was a Christian for about three years. Right after Christ, leading to what we're about to read today, his whole Christian life spanned only three years. But that's because his life was cut short at an early age. So I'm going to show you a little bit of his bio. Stephen was born Grecian. That's your first fill-in. A Grecian Jew. Some of you are like, what the heck is that? What that means is he had a foreign birth. He was Jewish, but he was born in the empire, the Greece empire, the great Roman empire. He was born somewhere throughout that empire. It doesn't tell us which one, but we know for a fact that he was. And his languages that he spoke was fluent Greek. And like every good young Jewish boy back then was being taught from his family, their ancient language, Aramaic. He died at the age of 29 years old. And his cause of death was blunt, blunt force trauma from being stoned to death. And his major biblical roles is first, he was the very first deacon chosen in the church. This is super cool. He was the very first deacon chosen. So what started to happen is the church grew and grew exponentially, even at a much greater rate than Reach Church is growing, but we're still growing really fast. We've had to do this. And you want to be able to do this. And what happened was is the lead pastors essentially got together and said, okay, listen, we can't handle everybody's needs. So we got to raise up some pastors underneath us that could go and serve the people in their specific needs. 
And what took place to cause all this was some of the Grecian widows weren't getting the same amount of food as the born Israelite widows were, not, were getting. And it was brought to their attention. And the apostles said, look, we got to focus on prayer, fasting, and preaching God's word. So let's gather together and raise us up some elders and some deacons. And deacons actually came first. And they begin to raise up these deacons, and we're going to talk about what a deacon is here at ReChurch, because we have deacons, they just don't have name badges like you would think they would. So we're going to start it right here, because they presented this to the church in Acts verse 5 of chapter 6. It says, everybody said together, everyone. Everybody liked this idea. And they chose the following, Stephen. He was the first. And look what it says about Stephen. He was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. If you're going to be full of something, I don't know where y'all minds went, but if you're going to be full of if you're going to be full of something, you want to be full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Those are two great things to be filled with, and the word "full" means a continuous overflowing. So I don't believe this is just faith like the measure of faith that everybody is given. Like the Bible says, all people are given at least some measure of faith so they can come to believe. But this is coming out of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where we're doing this actually on a Wednesday night. We just started last Wednesday. If you missed, you could jump in this Wednesday. We're going to do a little bit of a recap. We're doing the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit and going in depth detail and showing biblical examples of them being used and then practical examples of them being used. But one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that of special faith. It's when somebody's got this crazy radical faith to believe for things beyond what normal people, even normal Christians, would believe. He was overflowing in faith and the Holy Spirit. Number two, he was the first Christian to be, everybody said together, martyred. And what does that mean? It simply means that he was killed for his beliefs in Jesus. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't... uh, he didn't hurt anybody. He didn't steal from anybody. He didn't, he didn't blaspheme God. He didn't do anything back then that really warranted death. But just like Jesus, Jesus was innocent. Stephen is now innocent. But the religious leaders hate his guts. You know why? Because he speaks the truth without fear. And he got martyred for it. We're going to read about that story. That's why I'm just kind of skimming through it right now. Is we're going to read about it. But I want to bring up something really cool about Stephen. Look at this. He was the first Christian to be martyred. That's pretty cool. I mean, not really, kind of. If there's one way to go, I guess that's the way to go. But not really even go that way. I'd rather just go in my sleep. I don't know about you. but Or get raptured. One of the two. Okay. But look at this one. He was also the first deacon. There was something special on Stephen's life. He was first at everything he did. God selected him first above the rest. It reminds me of the great immortal here in America, Ricky Bobby. Because if you're not first, you're last. Okay. Number three, he was known for his faith. Being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We just read that. But look what he was also known for. His, everybody say it, passion and purpose for both God and people. Stephen was filled with both. We lack these two things in a grave way in our world today. If we're passionate, we're often passionate about the wrong things. And purpose, we're distracted so much that we're leaving out the purpose that God has placed on our life. Not here at Reach Church. That's not our vision because this is all built within our vision and our values. Everything about this is who we are. We know by looking at every wall in every room that you walk in what the vision statement is. There is the know God, right? So you can come to the understanding of the relationship that God has always wanted with you. And then when you know him, you can find freedom through him. Freedom from your past, from the hurt, the shame, the pain. And then once you are free, then you're able to discover the purpose that God has placed on the inside of you. And once you discover that purpose, look now, you will be able to make a difference 
in other people's lives, which I believe is the ultimate purpose of the church and of our individual lives is to make a difference in the lives of others. And we see this Stephen was this young 29-year-old on fire man for Jesus. And you know what? He got arrested for it. And he got brought to trial. Can you imagine? Thank God we lived in the most blessed nation on this planet where we could declare the word of God and, and worship in freedom. Thank God for that. He was just telling people the truth about Jesus, and he was arrested, and he was brought to stand trial. And then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And if you look at all of Acts chapter 7, it's Stephen's first and last public sermon. And what was so amazing about it is he wasn't some well-versed theologian, but he was quoting the word of God from thousands and hundreds of years before him. He was quoting the word of God with great precision and great power, and it was rattling the cages of the religious. And they became infuriated at him. And we're going to pick it up here in, in Acts seven fifty one. He said, you stubborn people, just like Jesus, Jesus never corrected the sinner. Jesus never came down. Let me say it like that. He corrected them. He never came down on them. He never condemned them. He never, he never smashed them in the mouth for being a sinner. He always loved them, through correction, brought them to the truth. But with the religious, man, Jesus was four. He was just pimp slapping every one of them. I'm serious. Like, I mean, maybe not pimp slapping. That's probably too far, but. Man, he was, he was smoking him right between the eyes every chance he got. I'm, I don't know how to say it nice. Everything comes out of my mouth, I'm thinking, idiot, shut up, and just move on. <laughs> you know what they're trying to do? Jesus wasn't, he was frustrated at the religious, just like Stephen was, but what they're really trying to do is use tough love. Some people look at that and go, man, why is he so mean? He's not being mean. He's trying to shake them and wake them because they're bound by something that's even more dangerous than atheism, and that's religion. Because religion, it says, Jesus said, is man-made ideas taught to people as commands from God. But the religious leaders aren't even willing to walk a step in the mile that they've commanded their followers to walk. Religious is dangerous because it has just enough of God, of the truth in it, to fool people, but then it just, all it does is want to control people. And so he says to them, you stubborn people, you are heathen at heart, and you are deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. Wow. You know why he can ask that? Because they persecuted every single one of them. And look what it goes on. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, Jesus, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law even though you received it from the hands of angels. So powerful. Then he goes on. The Jewish leaders, they were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. They were ticked off. They shook their fist with rage at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Again, you see it? Over and over again, full of the Holy Spirit. He just poured the Holy Spirit out of him. But at the same time, he's a vessel for our honor, sanctified, set apart, and ready to be used of God. He's just a channel. That's why he keeps getting filled, because he keeps emptying the Holy Spirit. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed steadily into heaven. And he saw the glory of God. The Son of God, Jesus, standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Notice what it says. He has all of his haters, all of his enemies. They're speaking word curses. They're threatening his life. They're making fun of him. They're yelling at him. They're infuriated at him. And look what he sets his gaze on. Look what he sets his eyes on. He doesn't set it on the haters. He doesn't set it on the word cursers. He doesn't set it on the ones that are punishing him. He doesn't set it on the ones who are threatening him. He doesn't get distracted by what the devil's doing through people. What he gets distracted by is is what God is doing through him. 
He sets his gaze on Jesus because he knows he won't have to answer to a single one of those accusers. And he won't have to answer to a single one of those that don't believe in him. He don't have to answer to a single one that's cursing him and mocking him. He doesn't have to answer to any of those. He has to answer to Jesus. So he fixes his eyes on him. And look what happens. And he told them, look, I see heavens open. And the Son of Man is standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. Can you picture this? It's like kindergarten. Like seriously, what are these people doing? Think about the crazy part of this. You know why they're doing this? Because they know it's the truth. And they don't want to hear the truth. They want to fill their cup. A vengeance. They want to shut these Jesus people up because they're speaking the truth and the truth is going to set people free from the religion that we've had them bound in and then we're not going to be able to use them to get all their money and all their service to us. I don't ever step on this platform one time without bowing my heart on my knees before God with tears in my eyes. Holy Spirit, Seize control of what I say today. Let it be your words and not my own. Speak forth. Let your anointing drip from my lips. I'll just quote scripture over and over again. Because the moment that somebody makes this about them is the moment the devil has completely already gotten inside of their camp. And they're going to go down and go down quick. This isn't mine. This is Jesus's. He is the owner of Reach Church. And we are the stewards. He's not called us to own it. He's called us to steward what he is owning, what he has given to us. Are you with me? And look at this. They rushed at him, and they dragged him out in the city, and they began to stone him to death. His accusers, they took off their coats, and they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. We're going to talk about Saul next week. Saul later would become Paul. Saul was the greatest persecutor of Christians of his time until he met Jesus face to face. He got knocked off of a donkey onto his donkey. And his life was forever changed. You know what's so unique about this? Most believe, remember what Saul's job was? Saul's job was to go and hunt Christians, either kill them or bring them back to stand trial so they could be murdered. Most believe, and I do, that Saul, the reason why they're laying their coats at his feet is it's a sign of honor and a submission to authority. So what we believe, what most theologians believe is this, is that Saul's the one that actually arrested Stephen and brought him to his death. And then we're going to see, I believe that this moment stuck in Saul. You know, I, I believe this with all of my heart, very rare, very seldom, Does anybody ever go from never, ever knowing a thing about Jesus, never, ever even having something in their life that happened that is a setup? Maybe it's not even God to them, but there was something that happened in their life that was a setup for the softening of their heart so that when Jesus came knocking on the door of that heart, they would let him in. I believe this is a huge step for Saul. I think something happened that day, and it began to open his heart, and then Jesus would show himself to him. And radically turn Saul's life around. I'm not going to jump into it because we're doing it next week. Look at this. His final words. Listen. They weren't like four and three letter words. Do you follow what I'm telling you? It wasn't like a Kevin Hart comedy show. It was a prayer. Stephen chose his final words to be a prayer. And not just any prayer. But a prayer of, everybody said together, forgiveness. For his attackers. Stephen had forgiveness. For those who on the outside looking in from a humanistic point of view, they didn't deserve forgiveness. They were evil. They were being used of the devil to harm a young man's life who did nothing wrong. But Stephen knew the big picture. And he knew it wasn't them doing it. It was the enemy that had infiltrated their minds and their hearts that was driving them to do this. 
And Stephen doesn't pray a prayer of vengeance. Stephen doesn't pray a prayer of God. Help me. Oh, woe is me. Listen to this now. Stephen doesn't have this prayer. God, I don't understand what's going on. I'm a Christian. How could all these bad things be happening to me? I've just lived my life for you. I've done my best for you. How come all these bad things? Do you know the number one enemy to you, the number one, I think, weapon that the enemy loves to use and those that have been hurt is to give you a victim mentality? Super dangerous. I'm not minimalizing anything that you've been through. You may have been a victim of something, but you don't have to remain a victim. That's what Jesus does. He comes in and he turns all of that calamity, all of that hurt, all of that pain. He strips it away from us and he gives us our dignity back. He gives us virtue. He gives us a a freedom within us that nobody else can explain. This is who Jesus is. This is what he has come to do. And unforgiveness, it never hurts anybody but you. You hold on to unforgiveness. You're not hurting the one who hurt you, you're hurting yourself. Because the one that hurts you, maybe they haven't changed. Maybe they will never change. That's between them and God. But let me tell you what forgiveness really means. It means simply to let go of. It doesn't mean you got to let that person back in your life and let them do that all over again. It doesn't mean that it's not going to lead to something that's really amazing, and maybe God's going to redeem the relationship or whatever that was. Maybe it, it never needs to be redeemed, but the bottom line is this. You may never see that person again in your entire life, but you not forgiving them, it's only crippling you from being the fullness of who God has called you to be. And Stephen understood the words of Jesus well, that if you do not forgive, then you cannot be forgot, forgiven. This is... This is what drives me. I just want to let go and let God. And I can tell you there's times where I've let go of things that have happened to me. Somebody's wronged me. Somebody's betrayed me. I let go of it. And I don't know that anything ever became of it. And I'm good with it because it's not mine anymore. I release it to God. And then there's times where God pours out his vengeance and teaches somebody a lesson. And I'm going to tell you, I'm in my closet going, I I would lie if I told you any different. And then I realized, wait, no, let me stop that because I don't want that to come back on me because I know I've hurt people in the past too. His final words were prayers of forgiveness for his attackers. This is Acts 760, and look at this. And they're echoing the words of Jesus on the cross in Luke 23, 34. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They're blinded by rage. They're blinded by the enemy. Jesus didn't want his accusers, his killers, to be held accountable for their actions. He wanted God to be able to turn their lives around in many, many lives. I believe Stephen is one of those young men who gave his life to Jesus probably after the cross. Look at this now. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. He was known as a man of passion and purpose, and this is what I want to highlight today and close it out with today. Be a person of passion and purpose. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. This is actually Paul after he is saved. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to Come on, one more time. Run to. You know it's okay for Christians to want to be winners. There's a weird thing out there that makes it feel like, oh, I've got to be humble and never win. That's dumb. That's not, that's not God, I promise you. There's his word. He wants you to run to win. Now, you shouldn't be cocky or arrogant about it because it's not really you. It's the Holy Spirit putting the wind in your sails to carry you across. But look at verse 25. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will simply fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. You're not running this race to get some medallion. You're not running this race for a trophy on your wall. You're not running this race so somebody else can think highly of you. You are running this race because God Almighty is building for you a palace, a mansion in heaven, and he is going to fill it with every reward that you have earned by the good deeds and the good things that you have done to make a difference in the lives of others. And that ultimate eternal prize is eternity with him. 
And let's move on. Verse 26. So he says, I run with purpose. Everybody say purpose. I run with purpose in every single step. I run with purpose. You know what that is? That's passion coupled with purpose. I'm not just going to run with purpose. I'm going to run with purpose in every single step. I am not just shadow boxing. I don't know if you understand the context of that. I love the word of God, how simple it is, and how science has taken millennials to catch up with Jesus. But let me tell you what that means. I first started boxing when I was in high school, and one of the very first things my boxing coach taught me was this. He said, when you're going to swing, he said, pick your shots and swing to connect, swing to hit, because you'll actually exude up to 10 times more energy on a miss than you will on a hit. So don't go in there just wildly throwing your arms. Go in there and box. Go in there and pick your shots. You don't want to just wildly be throwing shots at the enemy. You want to walk in there and you want to wait till you see the opening and then plant one square on a stinking nose by the power of God. Look, it says, I discipline my body like an athlete. Training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. We don't want to be disqualified. You're already qualified if you said yes to Jesus. Nobody can disqualify you but you. And the only way you do that is that you get off the path and stop running your race. And you choose with a willing heart to walk away from God. And I don't believe that any single one of you are going to do that or willing to do that or want to do that. But how do we stay on the path? We stay on the path by training. We stay on the path by working hard at the call, reading our Bible, praying, declaring faith. Are you with me? You believe this? Can you give Jesus one big thank you for his word?